This is our Sunday School lesson for July 15, 2018. This is Lesson 7. It is from Unit 2. And in our Faith Pathway Study Manual, the lesson is entitled, Persistence Pays Off. And in our Standard Lesson Commentary, uh, the lesson is entitled, The Widow and the unjust judge. And our background scripture is Psalms number 145 verses 13 through 20. Our background scripture is Luke the 18th chapter verses 1 through 8 and our printed passage is Luke the 18th chapter verses 1 through 8. And our key verse is Luke 18, verse 7. Will not God bring about justice for his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night? Our lesson's aims are to examine the relationship between persistence and justice to value the need for faithful persistence today and become persistent in prayer. And our lesson is centered around the persistence of a widow woman before a unjust judge. And one of the uh, significance of our lesson is hindered upon the first verse where Jesus told his disciples this parable. And in the parable, he was stating to show them that they should always pray and not give up. And the contrast of this, this persistent message that he was trying to give to his disciples is is that although he was explaining to them the necessity of prayer and how men ought always to pray and the uh, the significance of this, but through the example there's the significance of the prayer in the parable that he told is not raised. He doesn't explain to us, or he doesn't tell the disciples what the woman prayed for. He doesn't state the wording that the woman recited or pleaded or in her request to the Lord, such as, uh, as an example, the model prayer where the Lord said, Our Father which art in heaven. He doesn't, he doesn't tell us the phraseology of how she prepared uh, different words and phrases to the Lord. But what he tells us is as an example of why we are to always to pray. He tells us what the woman did. He doesn't tell us what she said. He doesn't tell us what she thought. He tells us what she did. And a lot of times, uh, sometimes we act in faith as though all we have to do is just pray about it and then just leave it in the Lord's hands. And there is much to be said about that. But in this text, 
the Lord explains to us on the significance of prayer, he gives us an example of what a woman did at great odds against her outcome. But he tells us about her persistence, which obviously was based upon her being fervent in prayer. Now, our communication, prayer, daily prayer, uh, the constant uh, insistence of prayer. Prayer is our verbal communication in the spirit of being humble to the God that created all that is. And the more that we engage in our prayer life, the better our relationship is in spirit with the God of creation. Now, uh, some of us uh, have routines in our lives where we talk to certain individuals in our lives, relatives, friends, work uh, co-workers, and such. But some of us have a routine in our lives where we talk to these certain individuals every day. And there's not a day that goes past that I don't call and talk to my sister or that I don't call and talk to my mother, my father, a friend of mine. We've been friends since grade school and we talk to each other every day. And we have this anticipation of the conversation that we will have with that significant person in our life that we have grown accustomed to and we look forward to it and we benefit from the conversation. Uh, it is rewarding to us uh, even in not just in our spirit, but just in our humanness. Uh, the conversation is beneficial. Uh, so also is the same as our engagement and our practice of our prayerful life with the God of creation. Uh, the Proverbs, the uh, 18th uh, chapter in Proverbs in the 21st verse says that death and life are in the power of the tongue and those that enjoy the fruit of it will love it. And so what it's saying to us is, is that if we engage in positive, constructive, meaningful dialogue with the God of creation, if we exercise positive, constructive thinking and action in our speech, then we will reap the sowing of what we have spoken into existence and what we speak will return to us into the favor and into the actual utterance of how we released it. So if we speak life, we will receive life. But if we speak death, then we will receive death. So how well are we practicing the power of our tongue? This is also capsulized into the practice of prayer. Now, we know this is a familiar passage of the story of the widow woman who is approaching a judge who proudly states that he fears no God and he fears no man. He is not attached to a, high, a higher divine order, 
nor is he subjected to any earthly beings. He doesn't fear anything. He has no scruples. So he does as he pleases, when he pleases, and however he pleases. And this is in total contradiction to the word of God as it was stated to how a judge should be selected and what are the expectations of that judge. Now, we don't want to just rely solely upon our own perceptions or our own concepts uh, or our own prerequisites of what we would attach to the expectations of what a judge should or should not be. But thanks be to God, these, these things have already been established in the Word of God. So let us go to the Word of God to see how these things have been defined and determined for us. In the book of Deuteronomy, the 10th chapter, we will start off first with God identifying himself to the house of Israel. And he says this in the 10th chapter of Deuteronomy and the 17th verse, for the Lord your God is God of gods and Lord of lords, the great God, mighty and awesome, who shows no partiality, no partiality, nor takes a bride. He administers justice for the fatherless and the widow and loves the stranger, giving him food and clothing. And also, in the 16th chapter of Deuteronomy, and it starts at the 18th verse, Deuteronomy 16, starting at the 18th verse, it says, again, this is to the house of Israel, and it says, You shall appoint judges and officers in all your gates which the Lord your God gives you according to your tribes, and they shall judge the people with just judgment. You shall not pervert justice. You shall not show partiality, nor take a bribe. For a bribe blinds the eyes of the wise and twists the words of the righteous. You shall follow what is altogether just, that you may live and inherit the land which the Lord God is giving to you. You shall not plant for yourself any tree as a wooden image near the altar which you build for yourselves to the Lord your God. You shall set up you shall not set up a sacred pillar, which the Lord your God hates. So the word clearly states that God is just. God doesn't have favorites. God doesn't show favoritism. God is not partial to a certain class or a certain group or a certain people, but God is just in all of God's ways. And because that sincerity and that pureness of being just in all manners of life is the best approach, once we allow people and I like the part in the 18th verse where it says and you shall appoint judges and officers in all your gates which the Lord God gives you because 
Sometimes we take the, pro the approach that the system has appointed these judges to lord over us. And there is nothing that we can do. Uh, our lesson, of course, would defy that because the widow, realizing the odds against her, she still persevered and her persistence paid off to a unjust judge who proudly proclaimed that he didn't fear God and nobody else. So sometimes when we engage in the approach that, uh, well, you know, that's how it is. Well, you know, that's how they got this thing rigged up. And it is true that the system is unjust, that it is a, this uh, systemic problem. But these judges, they are appointed and elected. And the people still have the right to choose who sits in these seats. So the woman prayed, obviously, that as she continued to make her way to the judge that she would wear down his injustice and begin to receive just for the adversaries that had take offense against her in her life. And so as we look at this judicial system today, <clears throat> not just nationally across the nation of America, but in our local areas, state areas, and regional areas. We uh, are confronted today uh, with injustice in every means. Uh, one of the major means of its practice is the monetary value. The scripture refers to it as bribes. So because of bribes, whether it was in the biblical times where many times they offered uh, cattle, they offered uh, quantities of meat uh, to the judge. But um, today, uh, we're, the judges are not just taking steak dinners. Uh, but today, we have a system of injustice which has become very monetarily motivated. And that is why we have so many executions and so many sentencing that's being offered through the courts of justice because of the monetary influences. Now, as we uh, look and uh, this is not an eye-opener, I'm certain, to those that are in our listening audience. Uh, we know that the prisons, uh, this was decreed, I believe it was in 1993, for one of the current, or I should say most recent, occurrences to the prison uh, industry here in America. But under the Clinton administration, Clinton offered in his administration the Private Prison Act uh, in 1993, I believe, uh, which allowed uh, private investors to invest in a private prison system, which now is offered on the stock market and I believe the acronym for it is PICS, P-I-C, the Prison Industrial Complex. And studies have been done to show that senators, as well as judges, along with private investors, uh, even the, the everyday common people, if they choose, 
can go on to the stock market and invest in PICS, uh, the private industrial complex. And so the bribe today is the return on your shares that you have purchased in a unjust prison system where now laws are determined and established against the vulnerable. And we don't have the time to go into it, but for those that are interested, you should read the book, The Dehumanizing the Vulnerable. This is the world of war of the war. Correct. I'm sorry. The war of words against the victims. It's by William Brennan. Dehumanizing the Vulnerable. And another book that is uh, worth its salt is The New Jim Crow by Michelle Alexander. There are other books out as well, but if you just go through these two books here, you will be infused with a lot of other books that are out there talking about the unjust or unjust prison system we have here in America. Now, I bring that up because it is the persistence, the persistence that the widow acted upon that caused her to receive justice from an unjust judge. And today, there are many associations and agencies and organizations that are out there that have for years been pursuing uh, the persistence against an unjust legal system, uh, prison system here in America. And just as the woman maintained her persistence against these things, then we also need to join ranks with other organizations which have been out there on the forefront of the battle line fighting this war against the vulnerable, fatherless children, and widowed women. And the new growing population in the prison industry now is black females in America. The female population is increasing. It has been increasing. And those of us who are sometimes silent in our actions, not just in our words or our thoughts, but in our actions, need to link up to these other networks that are already, as I have said, been out in the fight and have been doing the work. But of course, the more bodies we have engaged in this fight, the better the outcome will be. Now we know that the final word and the final action rest with God. We know that the text today tells us that will not God answer the cry and the prayers of those that have been taken advantage of, those that have been treated unjustly? And while it proposes the question, it answers it in the way the question is proposed because it says to us that however that the question is, is rendered as though it's uh, asking, will this not happen? But what it says is, us, is that it will happen. That this will, that God will avenge those that have been mistreated and taken advantage of. So it's not uh, proposing it as to whether or not. It is proposing it as a declaration that, oh yes, this definitely will happen. And 
when we look at the final outcome of our lesson, it says, I tell you, he will see that they get justice and quickly. However, when this takes place, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? Now, we know that faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. What are we hoping for? Because that will become the evidence of the things that we currently do not see. So let's be like the widow, the widow woman who did not just only pray, but acted on her prayer. And that's what we need more of in this present day and time is more actions, not just verbal request, but more action to act upon what we pray for. And then when the Lord and the return of justice comes, then the Lord will find faith on earth among his chosen ones because he will find us in the harvest. He'll find us in the labor pool working towards justice for all. God bless you and God keep you is our prayer.